to the next episode of the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. Coaching tennis is a difficult profession because the sport is so demanding in a number of ways. Athletically, technically, strategically, tactically, mentally, emotionally. And along with all of that, to be great requires a level of professionalism and character. And achieving that level takes work. There are not many coaches who are able to work across all of these areas of development, but we are talking to one today, Coach Bill Tim. Coach Tim is extremely accomplished in the, in the world of tennis as a player, a coach, and an administrator. As a player, he was an All-American at the University of Florida, where he won two SEC uh, conference singles titles. He's also in the UF Athletics Hall of Fame. He went on to compete on the uh, world tour where he won 10 national and international titles as a coach he is a uspta master professional and past uspta president and a member of the uspta hall of fame he was named uspta professional of the year in 1982 college coach of the year in 1989 and touring coach of the year in 1997 and 2002 He's also received the George Basco Lifetime Achievement Award from the USPTA in 2001. And today, he's still coaching players. And as you will see from our conversation, he's as enthusiastic about working with tennis players as he ever has been. And one thing to check out while listening to this conversation is something that Coach Tim wrote, which is called the Winner's Creed. And we will put a link to that in the show notes, show description, so that you can check that out. So with that, let's listen in to our conversation with Coach Bill Tim. Well, this is a conversation that I'm really excited to have. So I want to, first of all, welcome Coach Bill Tim to the Tennis IQ Podcast. Thanks for being here, Coach. Brian, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank you for inviting me. Well, we're uh, we're really happy to speak with you. Um, you know, Josh and I have been talking about the Winner's Creed, et cetera, a lot of other things that uh, you stand for as a coach. Um, but before we get into that, we'd really like to delve into your background in tennis, how you grew up. I know you're a multi-sport athlete. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, and I think your story there is really fascinating. And so we'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, how you got into tennis and, and how that worked its way through your college career, perhaps even into coaching. Yes, I think that's... Uh probably very important because it, it really is what created my philosophy with the game and uh, sort of oriented me in a, uh, a specific direction, which I've stayed with for as long as I've been teaching. So uh, it was very fortunate. I grew up in New Jersey uh, back in way back in 1940. And uh, it was an interesting time in the Northeast because we didn't have many indoor facilities at that time. And I grew up in a metropolitan area, uh, area called Maplewood, which was a, a commuter zone to New York City. And uh, we, we had a good school system, fortunately, that, uh, that allowed, I think, tremendous growth and uh, some habits that I was able to form early on that uh, were very fortunate. I didn't get a lot of input from my family. Uh, they weren't very interested in, in what I did in terms of sport or music or anything like that, but it was all available at the school and I took full advantage of it. So I've got uh, one of the things that a lot of my students don't realize is that I've got a uh, somewhat of a musical background as well, because we had uh, some excellent possibilities in grammar school in Maplewood. And one of them was we had an orchestra there that would come each year and give a performance. And then the kids would sign up for uh, instruments that they liked. They'd have solos and things like that. So I got interested in a, um, the cornet at that point in time because one of the uh, pieces that they played was uh, Flight of a Bumblebee. And the, 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 the solo was by uh, a cornet, given by a cornet. So that really turned me on and uh, got me started in music at that point in time. And I took up the clarinet after that and also played the bassoon in uh, one of the orchestras in the beginning of high school when I was there. And it was a tremendous uh, discipline for me because it was enjoyable. It was something I thoroughly enjoyed. And I lived with my godmother at that time and she was a school teacher. I, as a matter of fact, I had her in third grade 
And that was a very influential uh, meeting that we had. And eventually she adopted me and uh, it went along that I had never seen anything like tennis as a sport, but I played a lot of playground sports with mostly older kids. When I started off, we had a good playground at, at the school and I lived about two, three blocks away. And uh, there were a lot of not good little athletes, but to me, they were great athletes because they were all older. And so I was always having to uh, pay the toll that I was one of the younger ones in the group and had to abide by uh, what they said, which I very readily did. But it gave me a great start in athletics because it was not formal in terms of lessons or clinics or things that we have today. It was just getting out there and playing. And we'd play hockey in, uh, on roller skates and on the, in the streets. And then we'd, we'd, one or two of the players had uh, baskets up in the back of their homes. So we'd play basketball at that point in time. And then we'd go over the school, school grounds and maybe play some football and throw a football around. So to me, it was just uh, a general upbringing. And I, I didn't realize what a, what a gift I had to number one, be the youngest in the group. And number two, have uh, that type of leadership from the other kids in the group being older and being more advanced. So my, uh, my, my feeling was always that I, I probably became an overachiever at that point in time because I had to in order to keep up. And uh, it, it paid off very well because as time went by, um, I finally uh, went up to uh, my godmother's home up in uh, New Jersey, I mean, up in Lake Valhalla in Montville. And they had four hard true tennis courts there on a lake. I mean, and I felt like I'd gone, died and went to heaven because I had never seen tennis played before. And I had never seen, uh, never knew about the sport itself. But once I saw it being played during the summertime, uh, I fell in love with it. And I told her, I think within a year, I think I was about 12, 13 years old, that I was going to play tennis the rest of my life. And I was going to enjoy it. And I was going to uh, do whatever I could to be the best I could be. It was that that much of a first love. And it, and it followed through like that, because it really took over the other sports as I got into high school, as did the sports took over my music background. Uh, when I got to high school, uh, I was introduced to football and on a, on a major basis and loved it. And part of the reason I loved it, I think, uh, Brian, was because I had some uh, real anger issues when I was young and uh, had a lot of problems in uh, diluting that anger and, and trying to spread it out and, and be uh, a, a good citizen. And the football helped me tremendously, not only from a standpoint of organization, but also from the fact of how physical it was. To me, it was something that allowed me to probably get rid of uh, the hyperactivity that I had in. And uh, I had a very, very good sort of country football coach, but a good one. And he taught uh, some lessons that were not only applicable, obviously, for the football field, but for life as well. And I think that's where I think so highly of organized sports. I think. Today, we need sports more than any other time than we've needed, be, needed it before, because I do believe that uh, youngsters learn best in a, in a game situation. In other words, it's, uh, I was not a bad student. I was a good student, but I worked at it very hard. But I oftentimes would get uh, frustrated and bored with it because of just the memorization and the data and the, and the things and not realizing what it would be, be applicable to. So to me, sport gave me a meaningful context for learning rules and regulations. And the coaches became sort of father figures for me over a period of time. So I'm very big into team sports. I love team sports. But then, as I said before, once, uh, once I got involved with tennis, tennis took over as an individual sport, which was sort of a traumatic experience. Because what I found when I got more and more involved with tennis in high, later in high school, I started to play tournaments and I started to try to practice at the club and things like that was that it was very difficult to find people to practice with. 
<laughs> you really had to go out and uh, and recruit them in order to do it. And I did that. We had a, a very good social membership and I watched tennis during the, during the summertime. And no matter how old the person was or whether they were male or female, I'd go right up to them and say, could we hit some when they were done or if they were sitting around with a racket? And I was not bashful at all with it and didn't have many lessons, but had one or two very good players at the club that I watched closely and very conscientiously. And then I started to get involved watching it on TV when they had the US Open. And uh, it, it really, uh, it became more intense with me as time went by. As, as it happened, I started to play some local, some local tournaments as well, and maybe some around the Eastern Tennis Association area in that region, and uh, got more and more excited with it. And as it happened, there was a group when I, I guess when I was about 16 then, maybe about a junior in high school, there was a group of three or four players from Florida that came up to New Jersey and played, we're going to play three or four tournaments. And, and the one in Maplewood, the New Jersey States, was the first one. Well, I got to know them and, I, and they were really good. They were from Carl Gables and Carl Gables arguably had the best high school team in the country at that point in time. And uh, they they got out there and showed their stuff and dominated the tournament. And as the week went by, I got a little bit bolder and I said, well, what are you guys doing after this? And uh, they said, well, we're going to play up in Rochester, New York, and then we're going to go over to Narragansett, Rhode Island and play on grass. And I said, well, if I could swing it with my godmother, is there any chance that I could go along with you all? And so they said, sure, we'd be glad to have you along. And uh, so as it turned out, that was a very, very uh, life-changing trip for me because when I went up with them, uh, I got into the conversations with them and got much more than the on, just the on-court tennis that you would normally get. And uh, they suggested that if I really wanted to continue to play and advance, that the best thing to do would be to move to Florida. <laughs> and uh, Carl Gables was the spot to be, as, as I could see from the way they played. And as it turned out, my godmother had three or four years left to teach before she was retired and she wasn't uh, going to be able to move. And I couldn't move down to Coral Gables because you didn't have the ability to have a guardian. You had to have a guardian there or a parent there, obviously. And so that didn't work. But one of the players from Florida was from Jacksonville and he had mentioned a uh, bowl school in Jacksonville, Florida to me. And he said, yes, it's a, it's a naval and military school. It's a pri private school, but they actually have a big tennis program as well because they have a tennis coach and they have a couple courts on campus and tennis is part of their uh, interscholastic uh, competition. So he said, uh, and it, it also takes boarding students. So as it went, um, my godmother called the headmaster and through several conversations, it, it turned out that I was going to be able to go and uh, have some of the cost uh, defrayed by having a, a tuition scholarship, which worked out real well. And my mother, my godmother could still be teaching up in New Jersey. So off I go to Bowles School, my junior year in high school, military and naval, and I'm playing much more tennis than I ever wanted, to, than I ever hoped to play. But by the same token, I was still playing other sports. Since I was on some form of a scholarship, I had to play football and I played basketball. So I continued those sports and then did uh, track and tennis in the spring and uh, got, got some offers as I graduated and started to improve. I got some offers in some smaller schools, but we had played University of Florida uh, a couple times. They were only 75, 80 miles away in, in central Florida. And uh, I was enamored with the school. I, I, was being I was recruited in football there. So I went there on recruiting trips for football, which were fabulous. I was recruited in basketball. And I wasn't really recruited in tennis because I wasn't quite good enough yet. But I did get a chance to play them home and home. So we went there and, and did that. Well, there again, I... I Florida, I, University of Florida to me was the only place I could conceivably go to college. Even though I had some other uh, scholarships, I didn't want to necessarily continue 
with football and basketball. I wanted to concentrate totally on the tennis at that stage. And as it turned out, um, I, I had to sign with a football scholarship because they only had one tennis scholarship at that time. And I needed the tennis scholarship. So uh, I, I had talked with the football coach before I left. And I said, uh, really, what I wanted to do was play tennis. So therefore, if I played football, if I didn't have to play, do spring practice, I'd be able to play the season with tennis. And he said, that's fine. That'll work out well. Well, as it turns out, um, things, things happened pretty rapidly when I was down there. And two of my buddies that I played high school football with got injuries. They were from the back backfield and I was in the backfield and uh, they both got ACL injuries, which at that point in time, Brian, you, you didn't recover from that. That was your career. And uh, so I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, good grief, these guys are bigger and meaner than I am. And they're having problems like this. So uh, I better, I better pay attention to what I'm doing. So what I did was I went to the basketball coach and said, I, you recruited me in basketball. And if you didn't fill that spot, could I possibly take that spot in basketball? And because I need to get out of football, I don't want to be injured. I don't want to be in that position. And I explained to him what I was doing, which, uh, which worked out well. So I wound up playing basketball for uh, my freshman year and played freshman ball and didn't have to do the football. But then when I got out of, out of basketball, it was mid April and the tennis team was halfway done with their season and I was, I didn't get a chance to really work into what I wanted to do and things. So I wasn't happy at all. So the next year when I came back, I showed that, uh, that attitude, I think, of not necessarily being committed to the sport and tried to sneak away for do, play some tournaments and things like this and missed some practices in basketball, which of course didn't make a hit with the basketball coach, which I fully understand. So as it turns out, the season went along and I was not at all happy with, with what was happening. So I dropped out of school and uh, which wasn't a good move, move at that time, because at that time, when you dropped out of school, we were in the Vietnam conflict and we had a, 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 a mandatory draft. As soon as you were not in school, you had no waiver and you were going to be uh, recruited and you were going to be in the army. And I found that out about 10 days after I was, after I did it. And I contacted one of the other coaches. The reason I dropped out of school was because I wanted to transfer and I wanted to get a, a scholarship to maybe Rollins or someplace like that, that was a little bit smaller, but had a good program. And uh, as it turned out, it didn't work out well because uh I went into the service. What I did was I joined a local army reserve unit in Gainesville and uh, had a six month obligation of active duty, which was fine because then at the end of six months, I was done. Well, then I could transfer to Rollins with no penalties or anything like that and have my scholarship. I was going to transfer to Rollins and be eligible right away and everything was going to work well. But what happened was Florida got another tennis scholarship. So I now, after going into the service and coming out, I now had my tennis scholarship at the University of Florida. Again, I felt like I died and went to heaven because I had a couple of years of eligibility left playing SEC tennis and it worked out well. So that was really the beginning of my career in tennis and throwing the other, uh, letting the other sports go by the wayside. And uh, I was happy as a lark. I was able to, to, to do well on the team and uh, in the SEC had, had uh, made all American and won the SEC championships. So that got me started to be able to play the uh, summer tournaments for the, uh, the national circuit and the men's. And that was the beginning of uh, really jumping into tennis and doing what I'd like to do and, and do it well playing wise. But as I played, two, three, actually five years on the, uh, on the international tournament uh, scale. I, uh, I had good success. I got into a couple of the Grand Slam tournaments. I played well, learned an awful lot, met some interesting people. 
And one of the most interesting people that I met was Harry Hopman, who was the coach of the uh, Australian Davis Cup team at that time. And uh, for some reason or other, we hit it off pretty well. And when I was in Australia or even in other areas, uh, he let me fill in and practice with the other five or six Australians that he worked with, that he traveled with. And so I got a, a good taste of his philosophy, which I love. I thought it was, uh, he did it like a team sport so that they had uh, a team uh, bonding. They, they had five or six players that traveled together, ate together, would sleep in the same hotels. And, uh, and it was a, a wonderful aura because these players worked their tails off each day. But then when they got up in the morning and if they had to play each other, they were competitive as could be. And when they would, would play the matches and do what they needed to, they really wanted to win the tournaments uh, passionately. But by the same token, if they didn't win the tournaments, they were fine as long as one of the other five or six won the tournament. So they had that type of synergy that I thought was just fabulous. It was a, it was a cooperative synergy as opposed to an individual sport that uh, almost verged on the elitism in the States. So when I turned pro and teaching pro after five years on the circuit, I had had number of injuries and uh, finally it, it got to be a little bit too much and uh, a little bit too painful. So I started coaching at that point in time. And my first position was up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which uh, was very fortunate because Chattanooga, Tennessee was the perfect spot for me who loved the sport and was hyper about what I thought I could give the kids to be able to be in. They had a great tradition of tennis in Chattanooga. It was a small town. They only had two indoor courts at Manker Patton, but this was back in the uh, early seventies. So not many, we, I don't, we, as a matter of fact, we didn't have any other indoor courts in Chattanooga other than the two that we had on uh, at Manker Patton. And that allowed me to develop my program using more or less the philosophy that I had absorbed from uh, Hopman and what he had done with his players, which was a great example. Uh, they were the leaders of the, uh, of the world tennis at that point in time, and just uh, fabulous athletes, gentlemen, and sportsmen. So uh, I think that was my training and my background with what I did. And from that time on, I've uh, been absorbed with doing two things. Number one, working with youngsters and enjoying it and uh, developing them in a cooperative fashion, developing more of that team concept that they take pride in helping their partners become good players as well as themselves. And then at the same time, uh, having a chance to travel with them to tournaments and pass on the things that I think I had learned um, on the circuit at that point in time. It's interesting that you bring up uh, Harry Hopman and sort of the team uh, approach that he took with the Australian players and, and how our culture hasn't necessarily embraced that, although I think it's coming around to it more so than in the past. I know I've worked with some uh, athletes who participate in Olympic sports and they're seeing that, you know, transfer to like, so one athlete I worked with, she was in the, uh, one of the uh, Olympic luge teams. And she was in that class of where they were going from training individually to training as a team and being more cooperative and, and the right. transition there. And it, it was it's very interesting. And I think we're starting to see that a little bit more with some of our tennis academies, et cetera. Very so it, so. I think it's great that you're, you're a pioneer in that. Um, you had sent me uh, a screenshot of a part of your philosophy, you know, evolution of a champion. And in there, you... Um, I think you were quoting maybe from Bill Tilden or that, you know, champions are, are not born, that they're made. Right. And that it takes five years to develop a player and 10 years to develop a, a champion. Could you, you know, expound on that a little bit for us? Well, I, I think that's such an important thing, Brian, in, in today's modern world, particularly in, in this country, in our country. And that is that we're, we've been, uh, burning up with a microwave, a microwave type of mentality in terms of trying everything and wanting to do everything, but wanting it next week. 
And I think uh, that one of the things that was important about that was it it really made me understand and believe that tennis wasn't just something you went out and and did as for fun and enjoyed it. You could do it for fun, but you weren't going to reach the level that you would like to uh, reach unless it was a full-time thing, unless it was a part of your daily routine routine and daily life. And uh, to me, that wasn't a sacrifice. To me, if you love the sport and you were passionate about it, that was an opportunity. So basically the idea of five to 10 years, that made good sense to me. And uh, being an overachiever, I think from the earlier days when I was doing some uh, recreation sports with the younger, with the older kids, it showed me that uh, you needed the competition, you need the, needed the leadership to be able to have the guidelines with what you were going to do. But once you had that, it had to be a very cooperative thing. And I almost uh, adopted one of those, uh, Zig Ziglar was, was big in those days. And one of the ones that I liked that he said was, you can have anything or do anything you want in life and be successful, providing you're willing to help somebody else get what they want. And I love that because that was, the, to me, the, the highest level of cooperation. And that's, that's been my philosophy with the tennis is that I don't make you a tennis player. I give you some guidelines and give you my experience and, and hopefully facilitate the growth process uh, at a higher rate since you won't have to make the same mistakes I do. But the ones who make you the tennis players are the ones to your left and to your right and forward and back and the guys that you practice with. So uh, form that camaraderie and, and develop that, that mentality. And once you get that synergy, then you've got the best you can possibly have. So that really was a major uh, source of my taking my philosophy a little bit further, I think. Yeah. And obviously that also includes, you know, in the development of a player, developing all those skills and tools that you'll need to compete. And then it's about putting that into practice, right? Is that, is that how you see that, that evolution working? Yeah, that's a good point because that's an important cog that I left out. And it's, uh, to me, it was vitally important. I grew up during the time that we played actually three of the grand slams at that time were on grass. And, uh, and then the, there was the French championships on clay. The, the hard courts were played out in California and we didn't get a lot of the Europeans coming over to the States because they didn't want to play on the hard courts. They play the U S open and then go back to Europe. So to me, along with putting my, the philosophy together and making it airtight uh, came this, uh, I guess an obsession particularly in the way the game has evolved over recent years, over the last couple generations, to develop the players' all-court prowess, to be able to develop their all the spins in the game, all the shots in the game, feel as good in the backcourt as you do in the forecourt, transition and so forth, so that they didn't have any holes in their game. And we were now playing worldwide much more so, So part of the season, we'd play on clay courts. Part of the season, we'd play on the hard courts, part on grass courts, part indoors. And in order to do that, what I learned on the circuit was how effective the players were on the red clay in Europe. And it was an open, it it was a, 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 a mind opener for me because it was just so obvious when I first went over to Europe and played. As a matter of fact, I started on the Riviera and then went to Italy and they're playing Rome right now. So that brings back good memories. Mm. And my gosh, at that time they were even using Pirelli balls on slow red clay. And it was like you were hitting basketballs. <laughs> you, you, if you could put the ball away from the backcourt, you had to be a, a genius or a, a, a muscle man, but otherwise you had to learn the whole cor- the whole game. And to me, I was basically a serve and volleyer in college and, and loved it. I, I was brought up on the hard true, but that was my nature with what I did. So from that time on, I was trying to develop the other aspects of my game, which were ground strokes and finesse and slice and drop shots and defense as well as offense. And what I've seen in the last couple of generations, obviously, has been 
a movement towards slam bang. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, that's it. Uh, the players are unbelievably adept at knocking the cover off the ball when it, when they're in position, the ball's at waist high and everybody else is doing the same thing to them. But basically at that point in time, it was start, starting to shift with the two-handed backhand. Uh, all of a sudden, finesse, defense, and uh, you know, all court play was starting to diminish. It was becoming very much one-dimensional and excellent tennis, mind you, and good coaching with that. But nevertheless, when the players got uh, moved to the net or got to the net or had to hit his drop shot or uh, a, a defensive lob, they look like a fish out of water, these world-class players. And I think this has been a, a very strong evolution that I think is bad for the game, number one, personally, uh, because I don't think it's as interesting. Uh, the slam, bang, boom, boom is, is nice in some ways, but uh, I think, to me, most players are playing checkers, whereas they could enjoy playing chess at a much higher level, movable chess. So, yes, uh, developing the all-court skills has been part of the philosophy to do that before the kids get into their growth spurt at say 11, 12, 13 years old, give them all the tools that they need to be able to solve the problems that they will encounter with different styles of play and different surfaces. And I've promoted that and stayed with that ever since then. And it's been tough to do because uh, it's more demanding on the kids instead of just going out there and working on things that they do pretty well and a limited number of things, I'm asking them to do the equivalent of a football coach asking each of the players on the football team to, to become proficient at all 11 positions. And, but the results I think are far greater. I think for the amount of money that the players are, are earning today, uh, they deserve be show, giving a show that, uh, that is not just, a matter of attrition who wins the game, but one of art and, uh, and science and what they're doing. So I've stayed with it and uh, still enjoy it because of that. Still enjoy teaching as a matter of fact. That, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Great to hear all that. And great to, uh, to, to hear your background, uh, coach Tim. Um, a question that I have is uh, as you, you know, through, through your background and through playing on the tour and, um, you know, seeing players on all these different surfaces and seeing that in order to be successful as a player on tour, you had to develop, you know, all the different spins, all the different types of playing styles. Um, how, as, as the college coach with, um, how, how, were, how did you start to implement that within your program? How did you help your players realize that we don't just have to be, you know, slam bang, you know, hit the ball, hit the cover off the ball type players, but we need to have all the shots and be able to play in any, any which style in order to be successful. Your question is well, well taken, Josh, because it's been uh, uh, a love and hate relationship in many instances, because uh, here again, my original uh, entry into teaching and coaching was for the younger kids, the ladies, the club members at a club in Manker Patton. But the, the advantage that I had in Chattanooga, and maybe this is part of the thing that, that has worked for me so well, is I've been able, sort of blessed to find the places that I needed to be in order to do what I do and, and enjoy doing it. Chattanooga, when I went to Chattanooga, I was the, uh, what was called the special coach at UTC, which is University of Tennessee Chattanooga. I was a special coach at Baylor School, which was probably the only other school that could uh, knock off uh, Carl Gables in, at a high school level. They were, they were extraordinary. They had Roscoe Tanner, Zan Gary, and, and uh, Brian Gottfried was even there for a while. And, you know, they had, a, they had a, a whale of a team. And so they had tremendous competition within the town itself. And the, the position that I had involved the university, involved the prep school, and then my junior development program within Manker Patton Tennis Center, which was the sort of the central location downtown in Chattanooga. Well, we had the two indoor courts and uh, we actually had 
uh, six, or we had eight hard true courts. We had four hard courts, two indoor courts, and two grass courts. This is back in the 1970s. Okay. Wow. This was before any of this stuff was happening. So when I worked with my students, I was able to have them interact. Number one, I didn't have any because uh, uh, UTC practiced at Manker Patton with what we we're doing. And by special coach, I wasn't tr the traveling coach. I had my position at Manker Patton, but I worked with the university team, the Baylor school team, the juniors 24 seven. I had them every day of the week if, if I wanted to and could work through it that way. And that allowed me to be able to inculcate the type of philosophy and the, the type of play that we had. If I wanted to work on uh, aggressive things and drop volleys and things like I'd go to the two grass courts and take the players over there. If I wanted to work on hard court tennis indoors, I did that. If I weren't wanted to work on the soft courts and work on good, steady, consistent grinding tennis, I could do that on the hard true courts. So this is what I was saying that uh, I think the situation was perfect for my philosophy. And as such, I, th I was able, I make no qualms about it. I was probably able to accomplish more in the nine or 10 years I was in Chattanooga than I could have in a lifetime anyplace else at that point in time because of the mechanism of, of the way it was structured. Even the club, Manker Patton, was in the bylaws, was created originally for the development of juniors. <laughs> so as a result, when, when we had members that were concerned about how many juniors we had running around the, cl the club, there was no problem because we just take out the bylaws and say, well, I'm sorry, but this is, this is the way it's written and this is what we do it. Plus, we had 18 courts at Manker Patton and we only had 96 members. Now, in this day and age, you couldn't survive, that, a club couldn't survive on that basis. But because the, uh, the dues were low and it, was, uh, it had the different court surfaces and stuff like that, and we had a group of seniors that were ver very actively involved in playing. And I'm talking about playing competitively. So I would actually pair up my juniors, my 13, 14 year old juniors with some of the 45s and some of the 55s and therefore, the kids would learn the nuances of offense and defense, the, the things that they didn't see with the juniors going out there and starting to bash the balls. So a large part of it was the circumstances and the way it was put together. And I was just very fortunate to be, I think, in the right spot at the right time. It was good timing. So that's the way we handled it. Now, when I got to college, see, as I started to work more and more with the UTC guys, we had no problem because they were all part of the, the skull sessions that I would have and the, the talks that I would have. And I can remember at that point in time, I used reel to reel v, uh, uh, VHS uh, video. And if you ever want to try to set that up to, 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 uh, to show the players and, and whatnot, it's a difficult process, and lengthy, but it worked. So we were using videotape for skull sessions, review of the matches, and everything like that. And so I had all those things, I think, that helped make it work for me. But yes, it was very difficult at a collegiate level. But at UTC, it was not because UTC wasn't recruiting big time. We weren't recruiting, we, were in, we started off in division two and then went to division one. And as such, we were able to, I was able to recruit good athletes who were coachable, who really wanted to continue to develop their games. And it was a very special group of players that, that I had because of that. Nowadays, as, as time has gone by, it's more difficult to do that because like at Vanderbilt, we were playing SEC tennis and you couldn't really bring in the, good, the, the best athletes you saw and then develop their games in two or three years. It wouldn't do it. So you almost had to, it turned into more of a recruiting game as opposed to more of the, uh, the developmental game. And that's one of the reasons, as much as I liked college coaching, 
as I continued with the college coaching, it, it lost its flavor for me because it was no longer a developmental process so much as it was a managerial process. And I understood that. And I think it's, and Josh would probably agree with me on this, it's, it's a bit the same on the sports psychology side when working with a college team. Um, because many of the habits from a mental toughness perspective have already been formed and some of those yeah. habits are not so great yeah. and it can be difficult yeah. to, uh, to convince players to do, to do things differently. But you know, know, I to, go ahead. Brian, that's, that, I'm glad you met, you emphasized that because absolutely uh, when players, I've had a couple of players that have gone into coaching afterwards and uh, they wanted to be able to develop the, my, my enjoyment has been in taking local or American players, local players particularly, and developing them and having a rapport with them and develop them up to their potential, up through uh, beginning of college or into college. And that to me has been a tremendous gratification. And so you can see that as time went by and it became more businesslike and the foreign players were coming in more regularly Yes, that was a hard nut to crack, both psychologically and physiologically, because they had already been brainwashed in terms of, of what the, their style of play would be and what they were trying to do. And they looked at the game as checkers. So to try to expand that was not an easy task. I agree. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I, I know that one of the books that, um, you have mentioned was very influential, not only in your, your own life, but I believe you've also had players read this book is Og Mandino's The Greatest Salesman in the World. Can you talk about that a little bit? I'd love to. <laughs> uh, the psychology, I guess, to, to me, most players fail to reach their potential in the juniors and, and do what I call hit the wall because of the lack of psychological uh, training that they have or don't have when they're young. Uh, I think it was, I was listening to, um, uh, I was listening to, uh, a, a podcast the other day with, um, one of the all time greats who played golf with, um, Oh, Gary with, player. Yeah. Gary player. Great, great interview. And G Gary in, in it at one point in time said, he gave an example of maybe not uh, the best example in, in a positive way, but certainly uh, extraordinary example. He said he had heard that when, uh, when Hitler was getting to rule what he was going to do, he said, give me your children when they grow from zero to 10 and I, I will own them. And there's the brainwashing process. And so to me, if, if you can't teach the variations of spin and the all court philosophy before the kids reach that growth spurt around 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, it becomes very difficult. And I think it's been very rare when there's been players uh, like Federer who have developed their game even more when they were at the top of their game. But as a result, it's interesting because to me, one of the reasons that the, the big three are still able to play out there and not only play, but win and, and perhaps dominate the game is because they have the proficiency of an all court game. They have their own style of play, but they're just as good up at the net as they are in the backcourt. Nadal as well. That Nadal looks as you look at him as a grinder, but by the same token, this guy's a, a wonderful volleyer. He sees the court. He, he has the variation to be able to hit to the different parts of the court. He, he can play all the way with his rear end against the back wall, and he can play up on the baseline. So these players have perpetuated their length of play and competition successfully because of that all-court prowess. And I think it's one of the best examples I can give as to what the result would be. But yes, it has to be done before they reach the age of 10. 11, 12 years old, because once they get to be powerful and stronger and the testosterone go, starts going, it's gone. I mean, they're going to play, they're going to play the same style. And what happens is they fall prey to that wonderful, uh, that wonderful quote 
by uh, Francoise de la Rochefort called, a French moralist that I love dearly. And he, he made the quote that I've used so often with my players that uh, we promise according to our, uh, to our hopes. We promise according to our hopes, but we perform according to our fears. <laughs> and it's a beautiful quote because it really says it all in one sentence. It shows that these players uh, take the matches this past weekend. I mean, uh, with, with the finals of the, of the men's. That was pathetic at the end of the match. These guys are, are brutally whipped to death by the end of the match. They hadn't been playing. Uh, first of all, I think it's tough to play the best of five set matches when you've been playing two out of three all year. That's not a real good training mechanism. But then these guys haven't even been playing matches. And now they're playing the best of five matches and they're out there spilling their guts out on the court and, and trying to survive at the end of the match. They were two juniors trying to not to lose at the end of the match. And that was, that was a sad commentary on the U.S. Open as far as I was concerned, not in terms of their valor and the way they approached the match, but just what they really had. If they had other tools, you know, at least Zverev tried to come to the net at certain times and things like that. But as the match progressed, he was inaccurate. He was, he was inconsistent. And from a service standpoint, he went right back to a junior level with 70 to 75 mile per hour serves. I mean, that's, that's absurd for the U.S. Open, where the grand prize is $4 million or $3 million. I mean, whoo! <laughs> and the loser gets a million and a half. I think the public deserves the very best. I'm looking for Itzhak per Perlman playing the violin uh, uh, in, a, in a concerto on the stage. Uh, pretty damn near uh, uh, perfection for that. And I don't think it's happening. And I think the players are born, being shortchanged. Now, will it evolve into developing more of those aspects? Yes, I think it will. Because now that the, the power is being matched by, by most of the players, they're going to have to go back to doing more things better. And I think that's going to be better, better for the game. It's already happening with the girls, the women. I think that's, that's wonderful. But the guys are, are dragging their feet on it. Uh, with the exception of the top three. Yeah. And I think we've got, we've got adva an advantage of having those three as models for, the, for what I call the ultimate level of play. Yes. Yeah, which perhaps can, Oh, go ahead, Josh. No, I was, I was just going to say, um, Brian and I were actually talking um, recently and uh, just about how, how spoiled we've been um, oh. as you know, with, with the big three, and, you know, whenever they, they reach those, those highest levels, you know, the, the semifinals, the finals, they've been in this situation time and time and time again, and they've won. Yep. So it, it's as if, I mean, I'm sure they still feel the nerves. I'm sure the moment can at times get to them. And maybe, you know, maybe we saw that in some ways with Djokovic. Yep. Um, but, you know, they, they've just been through it time and time again, and they're able to bring out their highest level of tennis despite those nerves. Right. Where other guys, you know, team has been in a few. This is his fourth final, but um, you know, it was his first time as a favorite and Zverev's first final. So they're just not as not as battle tested, not not as right. experienced in that moment. Right, right. You know, Josh and and Brian, tennis to me, I, I'll tell you how passionate I am about it. And with my background, I would like to see tennis uh, made a mandatory subject in grammar schools. I think tennis is the greatest, one of the greatest learning tools we have to teach lessons of life along with the game itself. And as I said before, I think we, we, we youngsters learn better in a game context. They learn the lessons of life. And that to me has been a tremendous part of my development. When I first went to Chattanooga and then I was in Huntsville after that, Huntsville, Alabama, and took my program to another level because we had six indoor courts in Huntsville, only had two in, in Chattanooga. When I moved and went, it was, and, and started skull sessions and, and started the, the, the reading of Ogmandino and, and the things that, uh, that he was, 
I, to me, Og Mandino's book, The World's Great, the Greatest Salesman in the World, is one of the finest mental training books there is, because he asks you to actually almost use it as a training book to read the scrolls uh, three times a day for 30 days, each, each scroll, which is a great, a great training mechanism. You know, it's, it's the, re- the magic of repetition again. But these, these players today are, are not exposed to that, you know, with, with, with the life that they're, they're living and the money that they're making, they're very comfortable. And once they get to a certain level, they hit the wall, maybe at 17, 18 years old, they're not going to make those changes if they're comfortable. And you have to be really, I think, uh, OCD in order to be able to, to take it to that next level and make the changes which puts me into my personal situation, which was I still played weekend tournaments when I came off the circuit and I was working with my juniors. It was an integral part of my development still. And I would practice my serves at lunchtime. I did it for years because of the things that I was telling the kids, I was going to back it up and show them that I was going to do it as well. And it would have that effect on me as well. So my goal was far beyond playing at Wimbledon, f- playing at, at the French Championships, and and uh, playing uh, at, at the U.S. Open. It went beyond that because I was looking for the individual personal development of Bill Tim, and I could get it through my passion for tennis. I would discipline myself to do anything that was necessary repetitively, intellectually, research wise and put it together. And I had a group of juniors working with me on the same process. Yeah, Josh and I were recently talking about the importance, even as sports psych professionals, to continue to compete so that we can identify a lot with what, you know, our, our students or players are, are feeling. And uh, yeah, I think that's so great, important for us. Great point. Great point. Yes. Um, because there are many coaches who, you know, maybe they've stopped a little bit. They may remember, have some o- older stories. And obviously, it's a little bit harder. You know, I'm now I'm in my 50s, but I'm still trying to get out there and play as much as I can to do yeah. that. And, and it's it's hugely beneficial, um, which I think brings me now, Coach, to I, I want to get it, make sure we get into the Winner's Creed a little bit. Okay. We'll have a link for that for all of our listeners so that they can they can read this very, to me, valuable philosophy on how to how to be a winner. Can you just tell a little bit about how you came to publish this? Because I think this has probably been part of who you were even before you put it down on paper. You know, this actually, the format, the, the, the way I presented it was uh, the way Og Mandino presents his scrolls in the world, the greatest salesman in the world. And uh, I, I had become so preoccupied with that. You had mentioned in emphasize, which I'd like to emphasize again, that uh, I believe so, so heartily in it. And it, 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 it was a life changer for me. And uh, I picked up the book on my way to coaching uh, the Dominican Republicans down in the Pan Am games back in the early 70s, I think it was, at the Miami airport. I, I'd always stop at the, uh, at the book place. And sure enough, I see this book and I pick it up. And I read it. I, I couldn't believe it because to me it was poetic. It was uh, it was not necessarily religious. It was uh, spread out and it was uh, expansive. And uh, it it really the scrolls with the memorization process. And of course, I'm a great believer that you don't understand anything until you memorize it. It doesn't sink into your subconscious well enough for you to really understand it. So to me, you don't read it. If you like it and you think it's beneficial, you memorize it. And that's the same thing that we have to be able to do with our players is is to realize that unless they can do it without thinking about it, it's not going to work under pressure. So as a result, those two went very closely together. So I started picking it up then. And I was uh, I was working with uh, a good group of juniors in the university team, and I would have them read the book, and then I would take paragraphs and I'd say, okay, this is the paragraph we're reading. And then while they were doing push-ups or, uh, or leg lifts or something like that, I'd go from one to the other and have them recite <laughs> so that they were 
having that thought process go through their mind when they were in, in, in a, a stressful situation. And that became an integral part of their, uh, of their men, mental game. In other words, how they were preparing has nothing to do with tennis, but has everything to do with success. And I, I think it's an invaluable book, but that, that, that book, this, this was what you were asking about last time was I had recorded it a little bit and put it down because I've got this and then some, uh, some long statements on it regarding uh, tennis being uh, a mental game. And uh, it's, it's fun because I made that simply because I wanted the kids to be able to listen to it before they went to bed when they were on the car ride down to a tournament, if they had uh, had 10, 10 minutes before they went out on the court to play a tournament and just relax, put themselves into a relaxed state of concentration and just absorb it. Because I think it's a, it's a very strong general statement about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the effort that you put into a match and, and how you're thinking about a match as opposed to winning versus winning and losing. So uh, it's, it's been a very, very effective thing. And as I say, it's interesting because the, the outlines and the things that I've, I've done, I've done simply for my junior development. And uh, they've, they've adhered to it. And of course, now you have such high technology, you can do virtually anything. So uh, it, it's, there's no, to me, the greatest, the greatest uh, advancements that we've made for the, the sport of tennis would be the ball machine when it's used properly. And then uh, the, the, uh, the, along with the ball machine is being able to do the psychological stuff that we're doing uh, with the video, with the TVs, with the different programs that are being run. So I think it's a great, and that's what, that gets me back to that thought process of trying to make it a, and I'm not lobbying for it, but uh, I probably should. I, I did when I was with the USPTA for uh, years, but the idea of putting it in the, into the school system, because to me, the one thing that I see with the kids is the millennials particularly is basically it's difficult for them to solve a problem. They don't know how to solve problems. They don't have a systematic method methodical way of solving problems. And hence, this is why they get so upset. This is why they get into anger uh, problems, why they throw the racket, why they hit the ball. And that's totally, totally contradictory to the best interest of their, their development. And I, I think uh, the examples that we get are by two of the best players in the world, uh, Serena and, uh, and uh, Djokovic. They, they, they still do not have that little bit of of control, being able to, to, to deal with the worst problems coming up under pressure. And I can understand it. When people ask me, Bill, because they, when they knew me when I was young, they knew I was a holy terror. And they asked me, how did you, how long did it take you to learn this coach? And I say, well, I was kind of a slow learner. It took me about 38 years and it has, but that was my goal. And I, I incrementally went along with it at times. And it wasn't, in, it wasn't in the time zone that I wanted it, but I got it done. And I know exactly when it happened, how it happened, and why it happened. So my feeling is, Brian, if somebody with the, the, the issues that I had when I was young could do this, anybody could do it. <laughs> if it became the most important thing for them to do. And I think that's what, that's the, the price you have to pay. You, it, it has to be above and beyond anything else that you're going to do. But that's the purpose of uh, what tennis has become for me. And that's why I still enjoy coaching and why I enjoy working with you guys and uh, other people that are trying to improve and grow that game at a higher level. Absolutely. And I, I, I love, really love uh, reading through the Winner's Creed and really the mentality that you're professing of, you know, problem solving, being, you know, 
fighting, fighting until that last point, being willing yeah. to stay on court for, you know, for longer and longer, just to, to give yourself a chance. Um, yeah. But w- w- one of the things that really stood out to me was this concept of hustle and being willing and, you know, essentially confirming that you will hustle for every shot. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that came about and, you know, your observations of players, whether they, you know, whether, whether you, you see this or whether you think people struggle with that concept of hustle? Well, I, I think my advantage, Josh, you, your statement is well done, well taken again. The advantage that I had was probably the background that I had when I was young. And on a personal basis, uh, you know, just personally, my parents were dysfunctional. We had, there was an alcohol problem in the family. And as such, I was left on my own a tremendous amount. And I was always looking for, uh, looking for some positive reinforcement in whatever I did, whether it was my grades, my music, or my, uh, my athletics. And that, that was the way I could get some, some positive reinforcement, not necessarily from within the family, but certainly outside the family. And I think that had a, a great and a very positive input for me long term, because I went through all that stuff and I didn't do it in football. Or I, I, let, me, let me put it a different way. When I played football, when I played basketball, When I played, uh, well, I did track as well, but when I played baseball, but football and basketball particularly, I had a coach that when I would start to boil over, he'd take me out of the game. He'd sit me down. And and he he explained it to me. It wasn't a penalty. It was just that you weren't contributing the way you needed to contribute any longer. Now sit down, cool down, come back out. And I never had a problem with that with, with team sports. The only problem that I started to have was as I started to get into my teenage years and I started to play tennis and I had nobody doing the same thing for me or to me on the tennis court. And I was left to my own devices and my devices weren't built. They weren't made for it. I didn't do it well. And, uh, finally, my, uh, my godmother who was like mother Teresa, she, she was taking my racket away from me and saying, look, I, I'm not going to let you go out there and play. You're going to hurt somebody because you, you're, you're just you're, you're not in your, your right mind when, you're, when you get into that stage. And so I told her when I was 15, 16, before I went down to Florida, I said, I'm on my way. I'm going to develop the mentality and the control that a real champion or sportsman has. That's my goal. And she loved it, but it it was a process. And as I said before, having to come up with my own devices made it necessary that I had to do the research. I had to do the stuff and I did it. And I, and, and I was very conscientious with it and I could see the, and I think that, that gets me to one other problem that I think a lot of the juniors suffer from. And that is they look for immediate results completely. And you can't get it. You know, their, their, their show of improvement or their reinforcement that they're improving is that they go from losing to winning. Well, there's a long, hard gauntlet in between those two. And I think if you, if you don't become attached to incremental improvement and taking pride in incremental improvement, then you're not going to make the trip because you're just not going to get enough positive reinforcement to, to, to keep the motivation going. So it's been a, a, a real life process for me. And as I tell the kids, I, I, I get out there with the kids and I say, look, I'm not smarter than you guys. I'm not even a better athlete than you guys, although I'm a pretty good athlete, but I'm smart enough and I'm a good enough athlete to realize that there's got to be a key to becoming successful the way you want to be. And that is self-control, self-discipline, knowing what the right thing to do, the right reaction to different circumstances are, and getting and forgetting, burying it, pushing it to the side, and moving on and moving forward. Well, that to me is the message that these kids have to learn in tennis. 
my definition of tennis has always been tennis is the most sophisticated and civilized game of war that man has ever created. We're supposed to kill the other guy, but we can't lay a hand on him. <laughs> and psychologically, we have to be under total control to make the best decisions at the most critical times. And that's what we're looking for. And, I, and to me, that's, that, that's the work that I do in the trenches. That's the work you guys do in the trenches. Absolutely. You know, and I think um, Josh and I have talked about this even with some past guests that tennis is a combat sport. Yes. And yep. it's, yep. You, and, and it's as brutal. you said, it's brutal, uh, but we don't always bring the right intensity to the, the idea of it being a combat sport. A lot of times we self reflect. When I think of the Winner's Creed coach, I think of it, and I, I don't want our, to, our, mistake, our listeners to mistake this, it's not about winning one particular match. The no. Winner's Creed to me is about something you're aspiring to. And I think that gets yep. to when we're, when we're talking to players. And I, I remember having this conversation with, with several Division One college players um, that the idea here is not to just be better than the other guy. The idea is to be the best player you can be. Right. And, and, and I've right. said, you know, if I just want to be better than Josh, well, I'll probably just be – I'll just beat him by one point. Yep. But if I go out and try to be the best I can, I'll probably beat Josh by 50 points with no increased effort in that process. Right. And so the right. more that we can look at something like the Winner's Creed as, all right, these, this is actually a skill-based philosophy on how yep. I can get better at hustle, how I can be yep. better at strategy and anticipation. Yep. And then if I can work on these aspects of my winning or you know, competition as a skill, then I, then I can maybe – maybe that's part of our, our development or that journey of becoming a champion. Yes, yes. And everybody has – Everybody has the right to it if they're willing to put in the effort to do it. And I, I think you, you state it beautifully, and uh, it really is what it's all about. And I make, I make a statement to a lot of the parents of my, uh, the, the students that I have, but also to the students as well. And that is my goal is, to, is twofold while we're, while we're working on, on the tennis out on the court. We're using tennis as a vehicle to get you so that basically you understand the game of tennis better. You understand the, the mechanisms that allow you to be successful in tennis, mechanically, technically, and tactically. And then the second stage is once you understand those uh, tenets of success in, in the game, then you're going to only reach it when you understand yourself better. So by understanding yourself, it's a journey, you know, d d a cliche, but a good one to know thyself under pressure and be able to, uh, to live with it and be able to make the changes that are essential because the changes can be made if you want it badly enough. Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a great statement that you're making, but very much so using tennis as a vehicle rather than an end in itself. Right. Right. And so let's, um, Maybe we can end on on this point. You know the uh, the idea. I, I think this is something that you're continually working on. But this idea of a, I'll say, quote unquote, perfect practice, yes. along yeah. with um, you know giving your players tools to know how to correct different <laughs> things, whether that be just a, a simple mistake or even a strategy mistake. And um, you know, I'd love to hear more about that. That's. Actually, that's my pride and joy, because I think that's what I tried to come up with uh, over a period of time would be a systematic way to diffuse the dynamite and, and make, it, make it work in a positive way. So what I did was I, I went back to, and, and one of the things I've always been critical about, what we have a tendency to do very often is not go back to the origin of the problem and solve the problem by going back to the origin and create and, and go back to the premise and change that premise and make sure that that's going to do it. What we wind up doing is go back to the symptoms and deal with symptoms. So I wanted to go back to the origin of the problem as far as I was concerned. So what I did was over a period of time, this, this I don't know exactly when it happened, but over a period of time, I started to think, well, I need to prioritize what we're doing out on the court. What allows us to be successful 
when we prioritize what needs to be done. So I'd sit down with my students and I'd say, what's one of the things that you have, one of the, one of the first things you have to do in order to be successful out on the tennis court? And we'd, we'd go back and forth and this, that, and the other thing. And as a matter of fact, I've, I've got a copy of it here and I don't have the priorities on it, but uh, they are written here unconsciously. And that is that, that basically the priority that I want is what makes me successful in, on the tennis court. Number one priority has to be, I have to make solid contact with the ball. Nothing else works unless I first make so, solid contact with the ball. Number two is I have to get it over the net. And some of my Vanderbilt students uh, picked on that one for a while because they said, well, now coach, come on. If you go way outside the sideline and you hit a ball around the outside, of the net, <laughs> you know, you're always going to get that exception. I but, want to know who said that. I to... <laughs> it was Chris, Chris Grower, one of my all American players that came in as a high school standout. <laughs> but anyhow, first I have to make solid contact with the ball by the rules. Secondly, I have to get the ball over the net. And last but not least, it has to go inside the lines. Now, it's that simple. It's that simple, but it's also that complex because we're, we're, we're trying to do that with a moving racket, a moving body, a moving ball that happens differently every single time it's hit. And the, the, the conditions can be a, a, big, a big ploy in it, the, uh, the wind the sun, and so forth. So here again, how am I going to, and, and the other thing that I also work with my students on is, uh, I, the first question I ever ask them when they're out on the court is, do you believe you have perfect timing and perfect coordination all the time? And I've never yet in all, around the world, I've asked that question to coaches and students. I've never had a positive answer because we don't. We're not a machine. We have we have some fantastic moments, but we don't have perfect timing or coordination every time we hit the ball. Okay, well, if we're trying to make something so difficult as hit a moving ball with a moving racket, we're moving, and uh, we don't have a perfect machine and hit it to a certain target, and that target is reduced in size by the player on the other side of the net. How can you possibly talk about having a perfect practice? Well, you can't do it physically. You can only do it mentally. So what I do is I prioritize the priorities of, uh, priorities of a successful shot. And I say, okay, now I've, I've got to make solid contact with the ball. I've got to get it over the net and I've got to get it inside the lines. Now, if I do that and I do it every single time, what have I, what have I created? Consistency, the ultimate weapon in the game. I don't care what level you're playing at, consistency is the ultimate le weapon in the game. So basically, that, that's your premise to begin with. And I have to have, that's my game plan. When before I start a point, I have to, re again, realize I got to get to the ball. I got to make solid contact with that ball. I got to get it over the net. And it has to go inside the lines. If I do that one more time against the person that I'm playing, I'll ultimately win. It's that simple. But what stands in the way? What stands in the way is stroke production, maybe lack of imperfection on, this, on the things, even as much repetition as we get, and the focus on it. So to me, the match preparation has to involve three phases. One is preparation, two is execution, and three is follow-up. Preparation, execution, follow-up. Preparation, and I use a football analogy with this, call it huddle time. To me, in, foot, in football, you have huddle time. Why? Well, we're not getting in a huddle to pat each other on the butt and say where we're going to where we're going to go for a drink that night. We're getting in the huddle to get the to to diagnose the problem, and then cure the problem by creating another play. So the 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 preparation before the play is. Got to make solid contact, okay? I got to make sure that I get it over the net and I go inside the lines. So this is what I practice. I practice my game plan. See, this has nothing to do 
with beating the other guy, but if I do it well, I do beat the other guy. Okay, so then I go out there and after I've prepared, what do I do? I execute. Now I'm ready to return. Okay, so I'm in a ready position. And what do I have to do? Got to make solid contact, get it over, get it in. Okay, so now I take my stroke and all of a sudden I lose the point. Well, the first question I ask myself then is, did I make solid contact with the ball? See, I don't go into, oh, I can't hit a ball in the court. I can't do this. My timing's off. I studied late last night. I just very clearly go through my priorities. Well, did I make solid contact? No, I've, I didn't hear that ping. I heard, heard the thump and I mistimed it. I missed hit it. So I don't have to go any further. Because then I go back and what do I start to do? I start to say, I need to watch the ball closer. I need to see the ball come off his racket. I need to see the ball bounce. And I need to see it make contact with my racket as I'm doing it. And I can enhance that process by emphasizing my follow through. Instead of ripping the follow through around in a circle at Mach 1, I'll slow it down. I may even stop it and block it so that I keep that racket face in the path of the ball longer. And if I do that, I have, what do I do? I enhance my chances of making solid contact with the ball. It has nothing to do with winning the point. But I've, I've zeroed in on the priority item that will allow me to win the point if I do it well. Okay, so now I go through my preparation again, and I say, okay, now watch the ball. Watch it in his hand. Watch it as he's thrown it up to hit it. Watch it bounce. And make sure that you're, let, let's go to a block on that ball and just a short backswing and a point of contact. And what do I do? I lose the next point. So what do I do? I say, fine. Did I make solid contact with the ball? Boy, I hit that ball right in the center of the racket. It was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. But then my next question is, where did the ball go? It went into the net. If it went into the net, then I, I, go, I go to my next sequence, which, which is, well, I need to aim the ball higher. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is kind of, this is so simple that it, it, people think it's ridiculous to go through, but it isn't because you're, you're prioritizing. Okay, so I go to the set, I, I answered the first question, yes. And I go on to the second question, where did the ball go? It went into the net. If it goes into the net, arrow goes to my primary target. And see, when I'm practicing, I have my primary target out on the court. I don't let my students practice without a primary target and a secondary target on the court because that's their measurement. That's their, their, uh, their proof as to whether they, they did the right thing or didn't do the right thing. That, that, those targets actually become their coaches because if I miss the target, I'm in trouble. So I go to the primary target and I say, okay, I've been uh, aiming that target. When I start my little juniors, I put helium in balloons, tie the, the, the balloon to a net and put it three feet over the net. When they hit the balloon, it flies up to the ceiling and they're delighted. <laughs> but they have a target to aim at every single time. When they hit the balloon, they get a ticket. And the ticket is like a movie ticket and it's worth maybe 10 cents. At the end of two weeks, if they have 15 tickets, they can get a drink. If they're really goal-oriented at the end of uh, a month and they have 50 tickets, they can get a medal. If they, if they really are long-winded <clears throat> long, long -winded with it and have good goals in, a, in two months' time, if they have 100 tickets, they can cash it in for a small trophy. So they're getting rewarded, not for winning, <laughs> but for the things that they're doing out on the court. And they have no idea why. Okay? But it's got everything to do with winning and nothing to do with, uh, with, with, with saying it. The, the word winning doesn't enter with, it, with my students because it can't, because it's something they don't have control over. They do have control over unforced errors. So our first goal in the game is to reduce and eliminate the unforced errors because we have control over it. Okay, so 
I go through the second one. I made solid contact with it, but it went into the net. So I concentrate on the height over the net. Now, in practice, we've also talked and identified with hitting it high over the net. What, what do you do with the stroke? Well, one thing I might do is change the stroke and go with the slice so I get more height over the net. Another thing would be start it lower and finish higher coming through. So there, we, we go through the methods mechanically when we're on the court. But now we're going through the methodology as to as, 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 how to get there. So I go through the primary target and all of a sudden, and I may even do this. I'll ask the, the, the player to take a ball out of their pocket, drop it, hit it, and stroke and, and aim it that, that higher over the net so that they're actually correcting the mistake that they made. They're forming the habit of doing that. Now, obviously, you can't do, do that in a match later on. But what you would have done would have been to get in the habit of doing that methodology so you would visualize it. Yes. You would go, you would either verbalize it or visualize it and cement it down. So now what's happened, even though I've lost the point, I haven't lost, I, I, I haven't failed, I've learned and I've corrected the mistake. So what do I do? I feel good about myself. I'm not anger, I'm not building that pyramid of anger. I'm actually getting out of it because I'm solving the problem every time I make a mistake. And that builds into positive, a positive flow two ways. I'm correcting the, the, specifically the mistake and I'm feeling good about myself because I didn't make the same mistake again. I'm a great believer in, in what Braden said many years ago, and that is <clears throat> the court is a laboratory to make mistakes. Make all the mistakes you want. I don't care what mistakes you make, but doggone it, don't repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. So what I'm trying to do is nip that in the bud by going through a thought process and even a physical shadowing that will prevent me from making that same mistake again. And if I repeat that enough times, repeatedly over and over and over and over again, that follow-up of going through the correction becomes the preparation for the next time I'm in that same situation. So I've built a nice little, uh, nice little uh, program here where I keep my mental health. And that's what I'm interested in. I want to be my, I, I tell the kids that they, that they go out there as a team sport. When they go out there and they play, they always have a team. On their left shoulder, they've got the coach. Coach is whispering in his ear all the time. On the right shoulder, they have the cheerleader. The cheerleader is keeping them positive. Yay, 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 yay. So then the coach feels good about giving them the advice. And then you're the player. So now you follow the cheerleader, follow the, the coach and go out there and do it. So they're going into what we're talking about. And it's, it's more verbalization at first. As a matter of fact, the other book that, that I've used over the years has been this one by Chad Helmstetter. And uh, it, it, to me, it's just as, just as important in a lot of ways as the, uh, the world's greatest salesman, because it talks about how to talk to yourself and what to say. It's the uh, auto corrections with what you're trying to do. So I went through the second problem, went over the net. And so that, that's the last thought that's in my mind. And I may even shadow through the ball. I may shadow the shot that I want to hit in order to make that happen and keep my head down at the point of contact. And so I go to the next point, serve, return. We play, I play the ball back. And what do I do? I hit it long. It goes long. So what do I do? Good. I go back to my corrective methodology again. And I say, did I make solid contact with the ball? Yes. Did, where did the ball go? It went long. So what's my third correction, long or wide? Go to the secondary target on the court or stay with my comfort zone. And I, I've, I, I've gone through the comfort zone out on the court uh, with what we've done. So they have an answer, a concrete, specific answer to every problem that they make out on the court. And they go through it religiously and repetitively before and every point and after every point. Because then 
what I do afterwards is going to become the preparation for the next problem that I may run into. And by doing this, all I'm interested in doing is what? Eliminating my unforced errors. If I can eliminate my unforced errors, I got two thirds of the battle won. Absolutely. And then corrective methodology two, which is on the far right-hand side, is what do I do now that, I, now that I've eliminated my unforced errors? What do I do when the person hits a forcing shot or a winner? Because that's, what, that's the only way they can win the point. So again, if I make the, uh, make the shot and uh, we play the point and the person uh, and say, I come to the net on a short ball. And uh, all of a sudden, the person hits a, rips a winner past me. Do I get upset? No. It's a great shot. Great shot. So what do I do? I go through and visualize or verbalize the concept of hitting the same shot and anticipating where did they hit the winner? If they hit the winner there the first time, they're liable to hit the winner there the second time. So then that gives me a positive way to deal with the problem again. If, if, and then if I come back again, I'll build on that and it, uh, I'll do a different shot. I might hit a drop shot approach shot, but see, now I need my full repertoire of shots. And that's what the players don't have. Players don't get mad just because they miss shots and lose the point. They get mad because they miss the shot, lose the point, and don't know how to solve the problem, or they're going back to the wrong premise. Most of the players have been taught only to go through the mechanical problems that happen on a court. That's their corrective methodology. If you miss a shot, you got to run faster and get in better position. Well, I ran as fast as I could. How can I get in better position? Well, it might have been a tactical mistake then. Maybe I need to hit a different shot, avoid the situation, and then finally hit a better shot. This thing is worth its weight in gold. I yeah. mean, it, it, it's, it's fascinating because, again, it, has, it doesn't talk about winning at any point in time. It only talks about solving the problem that you had. And if you and the problem with most of the problems that the people have is if they're making the same pro mistake that they made at the beginning of the match or the next day or, or whatever, they're going crazy because, well, I, I, they can't they can't figure it out. They can't figure out what's going wrong because they've lost the logical sequence with the premise that's properly in, involved in there. Now, if I do this every single time. You can't do this like winning is an all, all the time thing. If I only do this, uh, if, I, if I do it, I have to do it every single time in the same way. Why? Because then I'll, I'll benefit from the magic of repetition again. And if I repeat it over and over again, eventually, subconsciously, I'm doing it and it's no longer there. But it is there. I'm now solving the problem unconsciously. And I can start thinking about even more uh, competitive things when I'm there. So it's, it's, it's worked phenomenally for me. But you have to train the kids to do it. And one of the things I used to do is if we had uh, a court, when we were using a court and we were doing four people on a court, I'd usually put six people on a court. And I'd have one substitute behind, two people, behind the two people on one side and one substitute over here. The four people would be hitting cross courts, just cross court to cross court. Say you and I are hitting cross court to cross court and Josh and his partner are hitting cross court to cross court. The other person is out. And in the back of each court, I have, I have a board with this on it. And the person that drops out is the person that has to turn around and read it. <laughs> and if they don't, they suffer ignominious defeat <laughs> but this is the this is the way we do our drills with the with the younger kids with what they're doing and and i give them a reward uh for when they do it well they get they get positive reinforcement and uh they like it and by uh, hopefully theoretically what we'd like to see is if they can continue to do that and stay with it then as they get older and older it takes care of the anger. Yeah. They're no think, longer angry. 
Right. I think what I like about this coach is that it, you're giving, you're teaching them almost like a checklist methodology, you know, and there's a lot of benefit to having checklists in our lives as ways of, of helping us go through things. And it's a process, but I think you're also, as to your point earlier, you're helping these players deal with problems, come up with their own solutions or be able to solve problems. And, and therefore you're developing some self-efficacy you're giving them some autonomy over what they're doing out on the court. It's not just about being told mm -hmm. what to do. Um, so I really, I, I really like this, uh, this this methodology a lot, um, and I think there's a lot. This that is this is this has worked great for me. Yeah, and but it, it's got, it's got to be done all the time. You can't do it sometimes and other times, and and but then in a practice situation, you've got the the la the, the luxury of the kids not getting upset to begin with. But then the tough part is to be there for the tournament. And I've actually told when, when I couldn't go to tournaments, the kids had to take a film of the, of, of the match and they have to bring it back because I want to see what's happening in between the points. Yes. That's why I know it's Josh and I are really interested in that in between point time because yeah. it's, yep. Yep. it's very revealing. It's almost like you were saying earlier, it's that huddle time. Yep. And, yep. And when we're solving the problem from the last point and then preparing for that next point. Yep. And it's amazing how many players do not take advantage of that, um, yep. that, that time to manage. And what, and what's, what's fun, Brian, is when you start them young enough and you're giving them rewards with what they do, they love it. Yeah. This, this, this is just wonderful. And uh, as I said before, you know, the ideal would be ultimately when they're 15, 16 years old, they're, they're not even understanding why they're calm and relaxed and, and doing the things that they're, because then at that point in time, all I'm asking them to do is go through a progressive relaxation and get set for the point. Yeah. Just follow your process, right? Yeah. All ingrained at that point. Yeah. yeah. So coach, I think we'll, um, we'll leave it there. I mean, that's a great way to end on, on this, this sort of process. Uh, I want to thank you again for, for joining Josh and I in the Tennis IQ podcast, and we look forward to keeping in touch with you and getting some updates over over the coming months and years. Thank you, and thank you for in inviting me, and uh, all, the, all the best to you all because uh, we need men like you doing the things that you're doing out there in order to make these things happen. Keep awesome. up good work. Thank you, Coach. Thank Take you. Care. You bet, Josh. Josh, I thought that was a really enlightening conversation with Coach Tim, and I'm, I'm curious what some of your takeaways were from that. Yeah, I would say um, definitely one of my biggest takeaways was his suggestion that, that tennis be taught um, at, at the grade school level, really from a young age, that that be a mandatory part of the curriculum, which I, I love that. I mean, he, he talks a lot about how, how important problem solving is and how tennis can really help to teach that problem solving process, which obviously is important on the tennis court and really in every area of life. So if kids are, are taught that, that problem solving methodology from a young age, I think it can make a huge difference um, really in how they see the world, how they go about um, solving whatever sorts of problems that arise in life. So that, that I, I think was um, that definitely a, a huge takeaway. And uh, yeah, he, coach Tim really brought, but a, a ton of wisdom. Um, so I hope our, uh, our listeners really enjoyed that conversation. So that's our show for today. Um, once again, many thanks to Coach Bill Tim for joining us on the Tennis IQ podcast. For more on today's show, please check out the show notes and the description. If you have any feedback or questions for us, please send us an email at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also use the hashtag tennisiq on Twitter. Um, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, um, as well as on YouTube. And if you'd like to leave us a rating, that will help other people find the show, find, find the show as well. Thanks again for tuning in to the Tennis IQ podcast, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks.